Good day, everyone. My name is Steve Murray, and it is a pleasure to welcome you here to the Department of Archives and History for a very special World War I centennial program. Before we begin, let me ask you to be sure and silence your cell phones uh, so that those are not sounding during the program today. Uh, today's book talk is a very special entry in a continuing series of World War I centennial programs that we've been having here at the archives and statewide over the past couple of years. And I won't go into too many of those details except to say you've got a couple of more opportunities that I want you to know about between now and the end of the centennial in the next couple of months. First, I want to share with you the wonderful news that you see on the screen that Alabama's commemoration efforts were recently recognized with a national award presented by the American Association for State and Local History. It was for a project called Remembering the Great War, Alabama in World War I, a traveling exhibit that has been all over the state in the last couple of years. You can see that photograph was taken in the old Supreme Court Library when it was on display in the Capitol and at a meeting of the state's World War I Centennial Committee. Uh, Auburn University, our colleagues there, took the lead in that project, but we at the archives were very pleased to be uh, contributors to that and, and uh, appreciate this terrific national recognition. I also want to be sure you remember to join us on November 11th. That's a Sunday afternoon. There's information about this event on the back of your program. That afternoon at 3.30 p.m., we will be having Remembering World War I, an Armistice Centennial Concert featuring the 151st Army Band of the Alabama National Guard with dramatic readings by Greta Lambert and Rodney Clark of the Alabama Shakespeare Festival. This is going to be a really nice uh, way to wrap up our commemoration of World War I. It'll be an outdoor performance on the front terrace of the archives here. The weather's going to be beautiful. We'll start about 3.30. <laughs> I promise. Uh, and that will conclude right at sunset. So I think it will be a very uh, poignant way to close out our period of commemoration. Uh, also, while we're speaking of this program, you'll see in here some fascinating information about the contributions made by today's speaker in association with the centennial of World War I, and you're going to hear more about those in a few minutes. I'd like to recognize some special guests with us today. Mrs. Fraser is here, and thank you for, for being with us. Also, Nancy Folk is the past state regent of the Alabama Society of the Daughters of the American Revolution. Nancy has been a fantastic supporter of the commemoration of World War I and been very active in the DAR and otherwise in making sure that Alabamians are aware of this very important chapter in our history, and we thank you for that, Nancy. And Dr. Monique Seifred is a member of the United States World War I Centennial Commission. She is going to make a few remarks at the close of Rod's talk. Uh, to tell you about what's happening nationally and internationally as we approach the end of the centennial in the next uh, in the in the next few weeks, and finally to introduce our speaker, I'm very pleased to welcome Governor Kay Ivey to the microphone. Governor, Good afternoon, and thank y'all all for being here. It's my honor to be here with you for this very special event, my good friend Rod Frazier. And um, Steve, I want to thank you for that lengthy introduction. That's the best kind. <laughs> <laughs> but more important, Steve, I thank you for the important work that you do here at the Archives and History Building. You're providing great leadership, and thank you for taking charge and being in charge. History is our most valuable asset. If we ever expect to go forward, we have to first understand where we've been. It's history that shapes our beliefs, it helps guide our future decisions, and it gives us a deeper understanding of those who have gone before us and given service. Alabamians are a people of service and sacrifice. And today, we have a unique opportunity to learn from an author and a historian who so effectively shares the stories of Alabamians in World War I, a man who has himself been in service to our country, my friend, Rod Frazier. Many of us are here today that know that Rod is quite good at storytelling, but his writing brings an even deeper understanding than just telling a story. Rod reminds us how Alabamians have so bravely stood in the line of duty 
and made their service and sacrifice. And folks, that ain't changed. Our people are very adamant to be uh, in service to their country and they're eager to protect our freedoms. The words service and sacrifice are key to the identity of who we are as a state. Rod's outstanding work details the significant contributions of others in history as well, but I think it's important that we note um, just how much Rod himself has given in service to our state and our country. Rod grew up knowing the importance of military service. He fought for our country and through his service in the United States Army. And while he was uh, as a uh, tank pl platoon leader, he was awarded the Silver Star for gallantry in action. He sponsored very, various uh, military memorials here in Alabama, and he still receives well-deserved uh, honors. Rod, I'm proud to, to, to know you and to call you as a good friend. And we want to thank Rod today for recounting these stories of Alabamians in World War I and for reminding us who we are in Alabama. Rod, I look very much forward to your presentation, and certainly it's an honor to join all of you to be here today. But before I close this, I want to invite Rod to join me here at the, on stage. And on behalf of the entire state of Alabama, Rod, I want to present you with this certificate of appreciation and a certificate of recognition for your outstanding service to our state here in Alabama. You make us proud. Thank you, what an honor it is to have Kay here in the midst of distinguished authors like Mel Storm, uh, distinguished descendants, descendants of this great regiment, the 167th Infantry Regiment of the Rainbow Division. Uh, Kay Hatton, the grandchild of Shorty Wren, uh, who is an iconic figure in, in Alabama's gallantry. He, uh, he was an enlisted man. He was a mortarman on the right flank of the uh, failed first assault at Curry's Farm. There was a second assault, and he got up with his mortar and made a difference in the outcome of that day. Uh, there's another lady here whom I've just met. You know, it's amazing how as the, the centennial goes on, these people who are icons of Alabama history keep surfacing. Who is the lady whose grandfather was in K Company of Birmingham? Will you stand and introduce yourself, please? <laughs> she, I wasn't prepared to speak to you. <laughs> my, uh, my grandfather's uncle uh, was from Jefferson County and uh, fought and was killed at the coast of Shishanyong. Uh, all I have uh, information about him is from this World War I uh, sign go, go to war. Thank you for being here. Uh, but, yeah, but, but anyway, he was killed in the battle. Yes. K Company from Birmingham was a very distinguished rifle company. There were many, many. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing the, uh, the, the passion that I developed in 10 years of research into this regiment. You, you get to know these guys. Uh, you, you get to know these battles, you get to know their failures and shortcomings, and you get to know their great strengths. And uh, here I have a slide in front of you that I want to, you to share with me. The, photo, the principal figure there is Douglas MacArthur. He's 38 years old at that time. This is taken just at the time of the battle at the uh, at, at, at the Argonne. Uh, he was a Brigadier General by then. MacArthur joined the Rainbow Division uh, as a Major. He was working for the Secretary of the Army when it was formed. And uh, 
and he saw to it that he got a good job. He got to be chief of staff of the 42nd Division when it was formed. Actually, actually coined the name the Rainbow Division for them. Uh, at his side is a real unsung hero of Alabama, uh, Walter Bayer from Gadsden. He worked for the telephone company. He was a prominent figure in Gadsden. He organized F Company. When 19, in 1912, when Bill Screws was sent down here as a regular army captain to organize the Alabama National Guard, uh, Bear was one of the first people to help him in, and did organize this rifle company in Gadsden and was eventually made a battalion commander and then later was the uh, executive officer of the regiment, Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, Bear was pretty much always in the shadow of Bill Screws, who was a great, great leader and very jealous of his prerogative. And he wasn't about to give anybody else that job of leading the uh, 167th Infantry. But Screws got the flu, and uh, it's the time of the Argonne, and had to turn himself in to the medics. And Bear had his opportunity to worked directly for Douglas MacArthur. Uh, the gentleman on MacArthur's left is very a French captain who was uh, an aide to Douglas MacArthur throughout his entire tenure. And MacArthur was with the Alabama regiment always. He was there in New York when, when our 3,677 guys went to New York and became an integral part uh, of the 84th Brigade, 167th, they were in the 167th Infantry of the Rainbow Division. Uh, he uh, was Division Chief of Staff uh, until uh, July of uh, 1918. So he was Division, he, he, he worked for the, for the Alabama Regiment, he, told, he was looking after the Alabama Regiment to see that they did a good job. Uh, for about six months until uh, Crow's Farm came about. And, and I asked my old man one time, I said, did you ever see Douglas MacArthur in combat? And he said, yeah, I saw him. Uh, I, I saw him on the morning at Crow's Farm, uh, about 11 o'clock. Uh, I, I said, well, what were you doing? He said, I was lying down behind a log. Uh, and it was raining and I was miserable. <laughs> That's what, that was his comment of that historic day. And... Uh, and I said, how did you recognize MacArthur? It's because he didn't have on a helmet. He wore a soft cap as he did here. He didn't have a gas mask. He was, he was always kind of a showboater, a lot of bravado. He wanted to, the, every, every soldier in the Rainbow Division recognized him, knew who he was because of the way he dressed. He dressed differently. Uh, in any event, uh, The, the Argonne campaign uh, was crafted by the head of Foch, the head of the uh, Allied F effort. And uh, Pershing asked for the job. It was going to be a huge, huge uh, offensive. The, you see in the schematic on the left that it ex the Hindenburg line extended from the mountains of Switzerland to the uh, English Channel and that was that was the definition of the Argonne campaign it, it was a big big strategic thing it involved uh, the English in the north it involved uh, the Americans in the south and the French uh, in between uh, it was hard to research it. Let me be honest with you. My presentation is going to deal with just the narrow sliver of, uh, of my take on what was taking place. The, there were nine divisions and three corps and one division and, and one corps in reserve when it started off. Uh, 
Steve, can you point to the 35th? Yeah, there we are. That's the, that's the, I, I decided that I couldn't grapple fairly with nine divisions. It's beyond my skill sets. My highest rank on active duty in Korea was a first lieutenant. <laughs> so I chose to do my writing at, at treetop level, at, from the point of view of the guy who was doing the fighting. And I opened with this 35th Division. It was a National Guard Division from Kansas City and from the state of Missouri. Uh, it uh, had a pretty good rep, and it had a very successful first day in the Argonne campaign, primarily because the campaign of all believable things had been kept secret. Nine divisions and one, nine, nine divisions, three corps and one corps in reserve, and the story had not gotten to the Germans. So the element of surprise was extremely important in this really not very good National Guard regiment from Kansas City and from, uh, from Missouri. The second day was a different story. The, these guys were not your best National Guardsmen, Governor, from Kansas City and Missouri. They were not in the same class as the National Guardsmen from Alabama by any stretch of the imagination. They were not as well trained, they were not as well led. So Pershing on the second day asked for a supreme effort and it didn't happen. There was no supreme effort on the second day. On the third day of battle, General Pershing realized that he had a disappointing division on the point. And on the third day of battle, he ordered its relief, which took place the next day. Pershing was a very decisive guy. Uh, he did not suffer fools gladly. He didn't, he, if a guy couldn't deliver, he'd be, he'd be toast. Uh, The 35th was replaced, the orders for the 35th to replace it, the replacement took place on the fourth day. And the uh, Pershing had ordered a kind of a reorganization of the whole of the campaign. During this time, uh, he personally involved himself with the movement, with the reshuffling of the debt of 125,000 soldiers. I mean, this was all, he was doing that while he was losing uh, on the point of the Argonne Forest. Uh, and the replacement division was the first division. Always the United States Army's best regular army division. So he took a disappointing National Guard division and replaced it with the best of the regular army, the first division. First division had gone to France with Pershing. It had given us our first victory at, uh, at Contigny. Uh, it was a known quantity. Uh, it, he felt confident that he could rely on them despite his disappointment in some of these green troops. He, he had had very, very good luck with green American troops up until then. They, uh, he, he used them a lot at the uh, St. Mael, and he was, he was baptizing these green troops and having pretty good luck with it. And so he was some part, something of a victim of hubris when he got to the Argonne because he had such good luck with these inexperienced people. And that was when he decided, well, I'm not gonna take any more chances. I'm replacing an inexperienced National Guard division with the best regular army division I've got. And he gave, they had a wonderful, wonderful division commander by the name of Summerall, who was an artillery expert, and uh, went by the name of Kill 'em All Summerall. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, the 
battlefield, some portions of the battlefield had been fought over in 1914. And this is an element, this, this is a shot of a portion of that battlefield that had been fought over when the Germans took it from the French in 1914 at the beginning. But in the interim between 1914 and 1918, uh, there'd been no real fighting there. But this, this was uh, what you would encounter in some of the terrain. This was a, uh, an artillery outfit uh, in which uh, Harry Truman was a battery commander. Harry Truman was very proud of the 35th Division, and when he became president, he uh, had veterans of the 35th march with him down Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, he was never he was never willing to accept that uh, that it, it had only lasted four days. He was always a defender of of his Missouri people. Uh, another important American was involved in the preliminaries to the, uh, to the Argonne. This is George Patton. Uh, he had already decided to make himself a tanker. Uh, he was a lieutenant colonel in this picture. He'd gotten promoted very fast, and those tanks were French tanks. Uh, uh, and he, uh, he, he had one day of combat uh, by the time of the Argonne. He was pretty badly wounded on the first day of the opening of the Argonne. And, and he was very vocal and very outspoken about that day of combat. He, uh, well, what did I do with my glasses? Thank you. It would help if I could see. Uh, he wrote his wife that he was very disappointed in the stragglers and in the casuals, and in the officers who were just walking around, who really didn't, were not doing anything constructive. He was, you know, where Truman was so proud of his artillerymen, and described uh, having wiped out a German artillery battery with his battery, uh, and was forever apologizing for him. Uh, Patton took another tack. He was always criticizing him and saying that they were a disappointment, and particularly the tankers. Uh, you know, he wrote his wife, he said, uh, uh, I was the only officer out there, and, and everything was bogged down and stopped, and the trenches were stopping the tanks, and I got a hold of a bunch of men who didn't know what they were doing and had them start to dig a trench, and he said, I think I killed one man. I hit, I hit one of those guys over the head with a shovel because it would not work. And that was pretty much his take on what war was. Uh, I'd like to look, I'd like to jump ahead uh, and tell you that uh, part of my research was that the at West Point in the in the archives, and I saw a letter signed by John J. Pershing to General Menahar when Menahar was promoted from uh, being Rainbow Division Commander to a Corps Commander, Fifth Corps Commander, and in it uh, he said, "It is legal for an American officer to shoot a soldier who is a coward." or who is running in the face of the enemy. Now that was the mindset that prevailed in the Rainbow Division, and the mindset that prevailed at the Argonne before the Rainbow Division even got to it. It was certainly there when the, uh, when the Germans, the, the Germans in the uh, 
First Division were noticed by the Germans on the other side of the line. And one German officer said, this, they, those Germans are semi-Americans. And somebody in the First Division said, they're not semi-Americans, they're real Americans. They, they had a standard of discipline that extended way beyond that of most American units. The standards of dress, the standards of behavior, the standards of executing an officer, and of carrying the spirit of military courtesy to its absolute highest degree. So we, we see the replacement of the 35th by the 1st, and that's where we meet Summerall, uh, this great leader. Uh, that's where they cross the Exmont Ravine and get into open warfare in the Argonne. Uh, the 35th had failed to do it. The 35th had not crossed the Exmont Ravine. It was a major G German defensive position that, that the 35th had simply failed to, to execute on. Uh, these parallel lines in front are trenches on the Exmont Ravine. The hill in the background is uh, Hill 240, which was a very, very prominent and very dangerous uh, uh, German defensive position. It had to be taken. Hill 240 had to be taken before they could really get down to the serious business of the Argonne. The four divisions the four regiments, the 16th, 18th, 28th, and 26th, you see them at the bottom of that exhibit, those four regiments crossed that Exmont Ravine on the first day and all reached the base of Hill 240. The only objective in the entire Western Front that was taken on that day was at Flaville, a small village on the left flank. So it could not be, you couldn't be bragging about its success that day. You know, Summerall said it was by and large disappointing, but we were the only, ele only element on the entire Western Front that obtained an objective. Now, when you, you see the Exomont Ravine here, and then you see Hill 240 there. You've got, seen a photograph of it. You've seen Flaville that was taken by noon of the first day. But nothing else was taken on the first day. The 16th Infantry took Flaville with two regiments because, and this is interesting, Summerall, when he devised the attack plan for the 1st Division, said, I've got three elements in my attack plan. One is I'm setting aside the 1st Battalion of the 16th Infantry and a machine gun battalion attached to it. That's about a thousand men that he set aside to use for some unknown and unidentified purpose. He was just anticipating he was going to get in a lot of trouble when he hit that German buzzsaw. Everything else that you see here had not been taken. Every one of those terrain features, Code 200, Code 289, 272, 176, uh, um, those, those about 200 meters high, most of those hills were very similar in height to many of the hills in Korea that were fought over uh, in my, by my generation. Uh, so you see what you've got, you can get a schematic there You've got a series of targets. Every one of those has to be targeted and taken by a discrete operation plan. It can't be a division sweep. It can't even be a brigade sweep. Summerall had said, I'm going to fight the battles with 
two brigades with the 83rd Brigade, which is the New York and Ohio Regiment, and then I'm going to fight the 84th Brigade, which is the Alabama and Ohio Regiment, to fight the rest of the fight. But he set aside that commando force, that strike force that he was going to use as a sacrificial lamb when the time came. He knew he was a tough guy. And he was willing, he knew he was going to make sacrifices if he had to make them. But that, that is, that sweep of terrain is what you see. Practically every one of those had to be taken by a battalion sized unit. There were company actions and platoon actions. These were small unit actions. This is, you see television, particularly coming from England, of the great, great artillery barrages and great artillery duels of northern France that were taken in 1917, and they failed. And when, when Pershing got to France, the French said, give us a fully formed division. He said, we're not giving anybody a fully formed division. We don't even, we have one. He took it with, the first division was the only one he had, and he wasn't gonna give it to anybody. And the French asked for 75 battalions. I mean, the Germans asked for 75 battalions to go into the trenches of northern France under British leaders. And he said, we're not gonna do that. We're not gonna give you 75 battalions of our infantry. And they said, well, you don't have any leaders. And he said, we'll make our own leaders. And that's what they did. They, they made their own leaders. We really did not have, we had, the regular army had done a lot of work in the Philippines against the Moros, but it was a different kind of war. You can see how difficult it was to take nine divisions and put them into a pretty narrow uh, sector. And this is what you've got here is a traffic jams uh, on October, in the early October. After the first division got in there and crossed the Exmont Ravine and crossed over the top of Hill 240, then the, then the traffic started backing up. You, you got to keep them moving. You got to keep taking those hills in front of you. And that was not an easy task. These are shots of, uh, of wounded men, lots and lots of casualties in the, in the Argonne. Uh, lots of casualties in the 35th in his failure lots of casualties in the first and in its, its glorious victories. Uh, nearly 9,000 men wounded and killed in the first division in a little over a week's time. So this, this kind of hasty medication uh, had to go on in a very big way. There was no, if you were wounded, uh, there was no assurance you were going to get evacuated to an aid station. One of the great tragedies of the first division uh, had been after it had jumped off and moved ahead of the Hill 240, uh, I'm going to read this to you. It's an authentic piece of history from, taken from the Donovan Library at Fort Benning from 1922 when a bunch of platoon leaders and company commanders of the 1st Division were over there trying to get promoted in the National Guard. There was no use for scouts now. We knew exactly where the enemy was. He knew exactly where we were. Company I advanced to a position 400 yards from Code 272. We crossed the valley, spread out in squad columns. Company I advanced to within 200 yards of the hill, but none went further than the company commander who fell 60 yards from the Cote de Chalion, I mean, from, from Cote 272, with a bullet in his head, and the second wave was decimated and, and became assimilated with the failed first wave. This is hard-nosed stuff 
folks. And we, somebody in this country has got to fight these battles. Okay, Steve's telling me I'm too long-winded, and he's absolutely right. I, I promise you I could keep you here all afternoon telling you these stories. Uh, here's another element of that sector. Two pieces of German artillery on the edge of the Petty Bois fired point-blank into them. Sheets of steel from machine guns on the other side of the valley. They swept knee-high over the ground, mowing down the advancing ranks and killing them after they fell. One of Major Frazier's companies, and there was no relation, I wish I could claim it, one of Major Frazier's companies broke and ran toward the rear, but they were stopped by non-commissioned officers. This is, this is the culture. These, these guys were human beings that some of them would get so terrified that they would turn and run and somebody had to stop them. That's what we're about. When we study World War I in its microcosm, micro, as a microcosm, uh, that's, what we, that's what we bump into. Uh, okay, let's get on with this story. Uh, I felt almost guilty about my research on this book. I had worked seven and a half years putting together 1,400 footnotes on sending the Alabamians. When I did this book, I stumbled into a guy the good offices of Dr. Monique Seaford, she introduced me to a guy uh, through her good offices who said, you need to look at the Donovan Library at Fort Benning. All right, I had already made four or five trips to the National Archives researching Sin Alabamians, and I felt very secure about the quality of that research. So I was just distraught when I'm looking at nine divisions and a huge thing that was bigger than Normandy uh, in World War II. And this guy said, go to the Donovan Library, and that was, I went to the Donovan Library, and that was where I bumped into these, these authentic stories told by these real, real combat veterans. It's like reading an exam you know, before you take it. It just wasn't, it wasn't quite hard, as hard as, as it was when I did those 1,400 on the other one. I mentioned the casualties, just to show you what was going on. And this is again from the book. A wounded soldier reaching an aid station did not necessarily mean he would survive or even receive care. In this first division attack from the base of 240, an aid station got cut off so that they couldn't have litter bearers taking these shot up guys further back to the rear where they could get any attention. So they wound up with an aid station in front of the Hill 240 that had 120 patients there with one medic, a first lieutenant, doing triage, triage on them. And guess what? 80, 80 of them, 80 of those guys died without any other attention. So this is why we should be so attentive to the army that we have today and that we're sending in harm's way today. I showed you the series of hills. Uh, there was one called 272 that had been attacked five times by elements of three battalions and they didn't make a single dent in it, not one. Five attacks on Hill 272, and it stood between the Cote de Chalion and Summerall's 1st Division. It 
So he pulls up this first battalion and its machine gunners that he'd held in reserve and hadn't used them. And he used them. And guess what? Half of the people participating in that attack were either killed or wounded. But they took Hill 272. And the Germans then started to collapse. And the, but the problem was that the Cote de Chalion was still a very strong, hardened German uh, defensive position. You go there today, as some of you have been this summer and seen uh, hardened German positions there that were, were defensive positions. So then Pershing realizes that everything is on the table, that if we do not take the Cote de Chalion and break the Hindenburg line there in front of the Sudan, then we will lose our place at the peace table and we will be ridiculed by the French who lost a million people by that time. So he t takes Summerall, who was the first division commander, and says, General Summerall, you are now going to be the fifth corps commander. The guy who was the fifth corps commander, you're out of here. Summerall's got your job. And then Summerall brings up the 42nd Division with the Alabama 167th and our 168th, and then with the, the 83rd Brigade with the New Yorkers and Ohioans, and somebody in the hierarchy has to make a decision. You, you can't put a division on an assault of one hill, you've got to choose. And he chose to use the New Yorkers and the Ohioans for that assault. And he did it because of Wild Bill Donovan, who was the Shamrock Brigade commander of the New Yorkers. Okay, five minutes. We're getting there. Uh, I've left a lot of stuff out, <laughs> but we're getting there. So Summerall gets the baton. You know, he's fought this battle before. I mean, he brought the 1st Division uh, uh, probably six miles. And he knows what he's doing. And he's doing it right. And Summerall uh, chooses the 83rd Brigade to make the assault on the Cote de Chalion. And this is a real Alabama story in spades, Governor. It's almost best kept secret in the state. The New Yorkers attack in the late afternoon. It's a position that was very precarious. If the Alabamians had been able to do on the day before what they thought they could do, then the New Yorkers would have been successful in its assault on the Cote de Chalion. But on the morning of the second day, on the morning of the second day, Donovan gets hit by a sniper in the knee. He can't walk. He can't move. The battalion commander of the battalion is supposed to replace him up there in the assault on the Cote de Chalion comes up. And Donovan's battalion had been wiped out, just gone. And uh, the guy says, uh, I'm to replace you. And he said, no, you're not. You, you, my, I'm giving you an order to retreat. Go back. And the guy says, well, you've got to give it to me in writing. And he, Donovan gave, him the, gave it to him in writing. So Donovan's out of the game, the New Yorkers out of the game, the Ohioans out of the game. So that night, that night, Summerall goes to Douglas MacArthur's 84th Brigade Command Post, Ludner Farm, this little farmhouse that's just burned in the last couple of years, not totally, but I mean these things are now going going away. He sits down there with he walks in there to see Douglas MacArthur and and he said to MacArthur, Can you take the coat to Shally on? 
Well, MacArthur had been asked the same question by this guy, Menaha, a major general who was his division commander, and MacArthur said, as long as I'm speaking to you in confidence, general, I'll tell you that I'm not sure. So then this corps commander comes into him and says, can you take the coat to Chalion? And MacArthur says, uh, we will take the coat to Chalion. And the guy says, you take the coat to Chalion and give me a casualty list of 5,000 soldiers. Because that was all you could get on a terrain feature that big. And he said, I'll give you a casualty list of 5,000 and my name will head the list if we do not take the coat to Chalion. That was on the night of the 15th of October on the morning of the 16th. Uh, is this great, great story, Gadsden's, uh, I mean, uh, Opelika's story about Robert Fallow. Uh, I don't have enough time to tell you all of this story, but uh, let's, let's go for a couple of pictures here. Uh, uh, this, this was taken of the, oh, this is the land they attacked over to take the Côte de Chalion. That's why that they were having to go through to take it. This piece on the left is the Mezard farm, and the one on the right is the picture that Dr. Seifert took in modern era, and that's the Mezard farm over on the, oh, right there, that is the Mezard farm, and that is the Cote de Chalion. Those tree lines and open areas are exactly the same, except that open area that you see there was really uh, small farms with hedgerows. Uh, in any event, uh, and this is one of the terrain features that still exists today that was fought over there, Tuileries Farms, it was a part of the attack area. But this guy here is, no town in this state has a better patriotic history than, than Opelika. I mean, it really does. It's, it, it keeps producing great soldiers, and its eye company was a terrific perform all the way through. But this guy here was an enlisted man with him, and went to the Mexican border with him, an enlisted man. They get back to Long Island. When they come back to Montgomery, leave Montgomery, Alabama, 3,677 guys going to Long Island. They go there and become part of the Rainbow Division. And somebody, somewhere in the hierarchy, has the good sense to give this guy a direct commission. He was a sergeant, and they made him, a, made him an officer. And he fought in everything that they had come up. I mean, he was one of the main guys at Opelika and our company. And then they get up there to the, to the end game, the absolute end game, and MacArthur has devised his plan to take the Côte de Chalion, because he had seen the Alabama infantry in the attack at Croix Rouge Farm, and it failed, and they had a second attack. He knew these Alabama guys would deliver for him. MacArthur had seen it, and he comes up with this scatterbrain idea that, well, we got to take the Côte de Chalion. I'm going to do it at night with an Alabama uh, bandit attack with no firing, and then they Ravi Norris from Aniston was in the meeting where he, the, he gets the plan and he goes back to meet with the four rifle company commanders. This is one of them there, Robert Fallow. He's a captain by then. And Fallow said, Major, it won't work. It's crazy. A bandit attack is, is not going to work at night with no firing. And he said, well, what do you want to do? And he, and he said, I have a plan. And he laid out his plan, which MacArthur then bought into, and they then executed and fought this terrific battle then all day the next day. And, uh, and it was all over. That's, that's, my time is up. <laughs> Now, Dr. Seifert, I think the floor is yours. Let me get out of the way here. Why don't you sit down here because you are, you are going to take questions after this. Okay. I, <laughs> yes.
Here is another of the Alabama soldiers. I'm just showing you this picture here at the end of Rod's presentation, which he has not shown you, because it really introduces what I wanted to share with you, which is a project from the French National Office of Forestry. And it's, it's a project that has, which was developed by the French, and I will come back if you want. Here I show to you so that you realize the extent of devastation. Here is the Meuse-Argonne American Cemetery. It is the largest American cemetery in Europe, larger than the cemeteries in Normandy. You have there 14,000 American soldiers buried there. Here you have a German cemetery in the region also. This is about Rod's book. That was his pitch to sell his book. And now I'm coming back. <laughs> now I'm coming back to the reason why I'm taking the floor, which is briefly to tell you what the World War I Centennial Commission has done in that region about this project. It has been, among other things, to support the project from the French National Office of Forestry Remembrance Trail. And it is a trail, you can see here, the whole battle described in this book by Rod Fraser. The French have established for the 35th Division, where you see an orientation table, where the 40th, 35th Division fought is at the bottom of this slide. They have established an orientation table where you can see all the battles, all those hills fought by the 35th, the 1st, and the 42nd Division. Then in the middle, where you see coat of arm plantation, the French National Office of Forestry has replanted with red oaks and sequoia 1,700 trees to reproduce the coat of arm of the first division and remember the 1,700 men of the first division who died in those woods. This plantation has been done by high school students who will be able 50 years from now to tell their children or their grandchildren Look at what the Americans did 150 years ago. This is going to be something when you will fly over the region, you will see the big red one and the coat of arm of the division in that area to remember those soldiers. The middle picture is in front of the Côte de Châtillon that you see in the background. And here you have a plaque to honor Douglas MacArthur and the Alabamian and Iowan regiment who fought there for the capture of Châtillon, the Côte de Châtillon on the Hindenburg line. And here you have, in fact, you can see Major General Gordon here standing there at the end of July when you had the 42nd Division and all the present 42nd Division, which is a New York Division, and all of the regiments with an historical lineage, lineage in the 42nd of World War I. And so they came to inaugurate that plaque. Here you see commissioners, here you see the orientation plaque in Cornet from where you dominate that hill. I showed you earlier what, how the trees, because it was, I, I showed it very briefly to you, but if you don't mind, I will go back to that picture. Because that is why the forestry people from the National Office of Forestry wanted to do this remembrance trail. Still today, you can see trees, you can see the stump of trees. Those are the stump that were cut off by the machine guns in World War I. Out of those stumps grew up new trees which are 100 years old. 
In that forest, you still see bayonets, you still see the barbed wire, you still see the shells stuck in the trees. And you also have the bodies of all the soldiers who are missing, bodies which have never been recovered. And now the National Office of Forestry has put plaques with the name of those soldiers because they keep telling us they feel their soul are in those woods and we need to remember them. This is why I had this picture for you of the cemeteries as well as the forest because in the cemetery and the forest is also a cemetery for so many of those American soldiers. But the Americans also brought some wonderful plants. Those are called obsidional plants. In the fodder of the horses, in the hay of the mattresses, you had plants that came from the United States and would grow now in those forests of the Argonne. And so you have a botanical trail next to the historical trail to remember the Americans. When, and I'm just showing that for fun, some of you were there at Croix Rouge Farm for the 100th anniversary. Um, that was Major General Gordon, the, uh, the Adjutant General of Alabama, in a parade of vintage car. Here you have General Langell on the Joint Chief of Staff. And those are the type of commemorations that we have organized during this summer in France at the end of May to commemorate the first American operation at Belle Woods as well as in, at Cantigny and all this early operation. Then here was the second battle of the Marne. And then the last commemoration was, I don't know if some of you saw this picture on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. It was a commemoration at Meuse-Argon, this cemetery I mentioned to you, the largest cemetery, where we had a very moving ceremony with about 300 soldiers, American soldiers who came from the US. And at night, we had a luminary. And the name of those 14,000 soldiers were read for 24 hours to, so that they would be remembered. So we are November 11 is arriving soon and Governor Ivy signed a proclamation and about ringing bells on November 11 at the 11th hour to signify the end of World War I and to remember all of those soldiers, all of those American soldiers who did not come home. There were 116,000 who didn't come back to the United States, more than in Korea and Vietnam put together after only six months of combat. And they should be remembered. And this is why I'm also bringing my cell phone and asking you to download this app on your phone, which is Bells of Peace. John just downloaded it. I told him just go to your app and, and type Bells of Peace. And you can do that. And you can download it. You can then, you know, select a bell, share it with other people. You can also speak with various organization to make sure that bells are ringing throughout the United States on November 11 at 11 o'clock. And you will also be able, where you see this nice little dollar sign at the bottom, to learn more about the World War I Memorial at Pershing Park in Washington, the long-awaited memorial that we are building to honor the Americans in our national capital where there is no World War I memorial. 
Thank you so much. Thank you for being such a proud and dedicated son of Alabama and for all of the tremendous work that you've done to make sure that this story is not forgotten. We are clear in your debt. Thank you for coming.